Amen. What another great day in the presence of God, spending time in worship, touching the heart of the Father, knowing Him, being close to Him. Hope you guys were as blessed as we were. And wherever you are, whether you're in your small groups or watching individually on your computer or phone or whatever, we just want to say God's blessing on you. Thank you for joining with us today. Hope that you'll be with us through the whole service today. And, and uh, God's greatest blessing on you. As we, as we begin today, I, I really want to, I want to share something from Mark chapter 1. And it's the first words of Jesus that we see in Mark chapter 1. It says in verse 14, After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And it says, he said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. Jesus was declaring that this is the time, this is the day. It's the same words that John the Baptist proclaimed too. Repent for the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus said the time has come. And I believe that we are living in a set time. There's lots of stuff going on in the world right now. There's lots of stuff that's a little bit crazy. Sometimes it's, life is unpredictable. It's out of control. Sometimes we don't know what's going to happen from one week to the next. But you know what? God is in control. And as we begin this new series, we finish the series on the Ten Commandments. We're starting a new series. But as we start this new series, I want us to always have a heart that's engaged in faith. A heart that's engaged in faith. Because Jesus is talking in, here in Mark. He says the time is fulfilled. But the time is an opportunity. And in the original language, the, the word that's translated time is the word kairos. And it's a time of opportunity. What we need to grab hold of of the time. It's like the time is running by and we need to grab hold of that opportunity. And this time that we are living in, it's a season, but it's a time and it's an opportunity for each one, each person of faith, each one of us to grab hold and to accomplish the things that God has called for us. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the people that God has sent out. We are the sent out ones. We are the disciples of Jesus because he has put something within each one of us. He has put his spirit within each one of us. He's put gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. He's put the fruit of the Holy Spirit in. Not to shrink back in set times, but to move forward and to take the stance of faith. To say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean in. I'm going to grab hold of this time. I'm going to use this opportunity because it is a time when God wants to use us. This world is full of fear right now. Fear of this, fear of that. God wants to use us in faith. There are things happening where people think, oh, I got to take care of myself. I got to keep to myself. I got to protect myself. God wants generous people. God wants people who are different than all of the things that we see around in the world. And when we think about people or things that bring change, people who bring change are people who are different. Darkness doesn't have any influence over darkness. Light has influence in darkness. <clears throat> and it's that light that's different than the darkness that has a change, that has an influence, that brings about a transformation. God has put something within each one of us. God has put something within each one of you. Faith, hope, love, 
joy, peace that a lot of the world doesn't have right now. A lot of the world doesn't have peace. A lot of the world doesn't have hope for the future. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Things are so unpredictable. I don't know this, or I heard this rumor here, this fear and unbelief and all this sort of stuff. But God wants us. God wants Christians. God wants the people of God to rise up and to take a stance of faith and to move in and to grab hold of the opportunity that is before us. God wants people who are different. God wants people who shine the light of faith, shine the light of love, shine the light of hope, shine the light of hope and joy and, and fearlessness. People aren't afraid, but they lean in and they say, this is the time. This is the time to be able to reach the people who do not know God yet. This is an opportunity for you to be a good witness for your family who might not know God yet. This is the time. So just like Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, this time, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. I believe this with all my heart, that this is the verse that shows us this is the time. The kingdom of God is near. And it's time that we take hold of this opportunity. There are people there who are needy, who are wanting hope. And this is the time for the people of God to shine. This next series that we're going to be talking, we're going to be looking at some verses. We finished up the series on the Ten Commandments, and now we're going to be moving into a series, and it's going to be focused on generosity. And I don't want to just only to think about generosity in terms of finances, but God has put within each one of us resources. Resources could be everything from, of course, finances, but we can be generous with our time. We can be generous with our words and our actions. We can be generous with our strength and with our energy. And of course, we can be generous with our finances as well. God wants us not to be people who shrink back, but he wants us to be people who are generous and who give and who, who sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15, we see the blessings of God that came to Abraham. And in those chapters, we see when God met with Abraham and God said, yeah, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have so many descendants. But there's a very key point in all of that. And it's not just for Abraham, but we see it clearly in the life of Abraham. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and all the nations in the world will be blessed through you. All the nations in the world will be blessed through you. And we see this in all of the covenants that God gave to people throughout the Old Testament as well. When he spoke to Adam and Eve, he said, he said, be fruitful and multiply. You're going to be a blessing to all the world. Also with Noah. Noah, after the flood, God gave a covenant to, to Noah. And he said, you're going to be a blessing. You're going to be, you're going to be a people who fill the world. God and his calling for them is the same calling that he has for us. He wants us to be a blessing. In times of difficulty, in times of uncertainty, he doesn't want, God doesn't want us just to keep to ourselves. He doesn't want us just to say, oh, okay, I got to only think about me, or I got to be selfish this, or I got to be fearful that. No. God knows. God knows the situation of your life. And the calling of God has not changed because of the situation around you. The calling remains the same. The opportunity is the situation that is around us. And the opportunity is a time when people might feel fearful. We can be people of faith. We can be people of certainty. We can be people of hope. We can be people of generosity. 
The calling never changes. Situation might, but the calling never changes. So as people of God, let's rise up, embrace the calling, and move into what God has called us to. Some of the things that keep us from being people who are generous. One would be selfishness. We can be selfish, and that'll keep us from being generous. Proverbs 18.1. It says, Proverbs 18.1, it says that the selfish person keeps to themselves. But they don't have a lot of influence. They don't have a lot of friends. They're very close to people around them. Does that sound like the calling of God for people? It's not the calling of God that God had for Abraham. God's calling for Abraham was that he would be a blessing to every person in the world. That's not someone who is selfish. God doesn't want us to be selfish. Selfishness gets in the way of generosity. Fear gets in the way of generosity. Comparison. We talked about comparison last week when we talked about coveting. And when you compare one person to another, or you compare them to me, or, or this person to that person, when we compare, comparison gets in the way of generosity. Why? Because when we compare, we always think about what we don't have. We think about, oh, look, my life is not as filled as theirs is. I don't have as many blessings as they have. Comparison always makes us feel either proud or we feel like we are inferior to other people. But God doesn't want that. So comparison gets in the way of generosity. So let's stop comparing and be generous. A poverty mindset gets in the way of generosity. What's a poverty mindset? When we think that we are always lacking something or we never have enough. You know, some people can be, they can be, rich. They can have a lot. They can have a, a, a lot of things, but they can still have a poverty mindset. Poverty mindset thinks, oh, I don't have enough. I have to be very, very careful about this. I have to take care of this to make sure I don't waste this, and, and I never have enough. Yeah, we need to be good stewards of what God has given us, but God does not want us to have a poverty mindset. We're children of God. We are children of God. That's who we are. Do you think that a child of God, do you think God would be happy if his children were always thinking, oh, I don't have enough. What's going to happen to me? No. That brings a disgrace to God. That would be disgraceful to God. If my kids were saying, Oh, you know, Dad, we don't have enough. Look at our house. It's not good enough. It's not good. And I'm constantly blessing them and, and giving them everything that they need. That would make me feel like they're not appreciative or they don't have enough. That would make me feel like, oh, man, I'm not being a good dad to them. But the truth is they have everything that they need. The truth is in God we have everything we need. God is a God who loves us. God is a God who blesses us. We need to put aside that poverty mindset so that we can be generous. If we always think that our resources are limited, oh, I only have so much money, I only have a little bit of this or a little bit of that, I have to keep to myself, all of these things kind of work together against generosity. But when we realize that God is our source, when we realize that he's the one who takes care of us, when we realize that God's calling on our lives is a life, is a life and a lifestyle of generosity, as we live in that and as we embrace that lifestyle, we can be people who are generous. I want to read a story in the Bible. In John chapter 12, and I want to see, I want you guys to see, I want to compare two people in this story. 
And I'm just going to read it through, and then you'll probably see the two people that I'm comparing as we, as we go through the, 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 the story. So it's in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the week coming up to when Jesus was crucified. He went to Bethany, and he uh, met with Lazarus, Mary and Martha. They were good friends of Jesus. <clears throat> and it says, Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at, a ta at the table. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment. Okay, so this is like uh, perfume that Mary took. And she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So just imagine the picture. Imagine the setting. Um, Jesus was sitting on the floor probably with a, a low table, and they were getting ready to eat. Jesus was sitting on the floor. Mary comes over, takes this, not just a little bit of, you know, sometimes we have our, our perfume bottles or our cologne bottles where, you know, you take a couple sprays and... Psh, 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 and it's just, you know, like a little cloud of... No, it wasn't like that. Basically, Mary took the whole thing and dumped it right on Jesus' feet and was washing Jesus' feet with this expensive perfume that she had. And then she took her hair and was washing Jesus' feet with her hair. It says, The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples who was about to betray Jesus, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Okay? And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So I want to compare Mary's heart versus Judas's heart. Okay? In this story, we see that the, the cost of this perfume was 300 denarii. Now, a denarii was one day's wage. So if you can imagine, this bottle of perfume costs 300 days wages. So someone would have to work for 300 days to get one of these bottles of perfume. And if you think about it, you know, with all the holidays and weekends and all that sort of stuff, you can probably, if there's 365 days in a year, it's 52 Sabbaths plus the holidays, this is about one year's worth of wages. So, for example, if someone makes, you know, just pick a number out of the air, if someone makes $1,000 a month, this would be worth about $12,000 this one bottle of perfume. So Jesus takes, or sorry, Mary takes it and dumps the whole thing out. Dumps the whole thing out on, on, on Jesus' feet and washes, washes Jesus' feet with this perfume. And if you think about it, what happened probably just about six months before this is that Jesus, or Lazarus had died. Lazarus was the older brother. Mary and Martha uh, was, were uh, uh, Lazarus' sisters. And when Lazarus died, basically the breadwinner of the house died. And so the person who took care of the house, Lazarus, was dead. And it would have left Mary and Martha without someone to take care of them. So we see that this bottle of perfume, this one year's worth of wages was something very, very significant to Mary. But, but when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, it not only brought life back to Lazarus, but it brought a future back to Mary as well. Because once, once Lazarus died, their future died along with it because they had no one to take care of them. And so we see that Jesus comes and they have a meal with Lazarus. And Mary, in a heart of gratitude and thankfulness and generosity, takes this perfume that's worth one year's worth of living 
and pours it on Jesus' feet as a thank offering, as a generosity offering to Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. And so it's not just a thankfulness also, but it shows her heart of love for Jesus as well. Then we have Judas. Judas, who appears generous, he says, come on, Jesus, we should have done something different with this. Here's the perfume is worth 300 days wages, is worth a whole year worth of living. We could have sold it and we could have given it to the poor people. Now, on the outside, maybe even before people knew that Judas was kind of helping himself to the money, maybe people thought, oh yeah, Judas has a good point. He's a generous guy. Maybe they thought, yeah, okay, great. That's a good idea, Judas. But later on, they found out, oh wait, Judas was, he was kind of a, he was a thief. He wasn't a very good person. He, he later betrayed Jesus. And so when we compare the two, we see someone who is connected to Jesus, someone who is full of gratitude, someone who is full of thankfulness. And as a result, their heart overflows with generosity. Generosity towards Jesus, but also generosity towards others as well. On the other hand, we have Judas, someone who is filled with themselves, and their heart is selfish. And it's interesting because Judas was selfish not just for the things that he had, but he was also selfish for things that didn't even belong to him. He was selfish for the things that Mary had. And so we see that Judas, in his selfishness, pretended to be generous, but his heart was completely wrong. Two people, two different outlooks. Mary gave generously because she had a heart of gratitude. She knew the things that had been done in her life. She knew the new life, literally the new life that she had when Lazarus was raised from the dead. She had, she had future again. She had hope again. And then we see Judas, who had everything. He had access to Jesus. He, had, he saw the miracles. He walked with Jesus. He probably... You know, even with the other disciples, as he went around, he probably saw miracles out of his own hand. Because Jesus would send the disciples out. And they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And, you know, casting out demons. Sometimes that, that was probably Judas doing that sometimes. But he was still filled with a heart of selfishness. Judas spoke about being generous to the poor. But it was a lie to make him look good so that he could get his selfish hands on the money. Mary's attitude toward her resources was not wasteful, but it was a display of extravagant love. It was a display of extravagant love. Very, very similar to what we experience today in the presence of God. God, your love knows no bounds. There's no limits to your great love. Let that truth overflow into your life. Let that thing be the thing that says, whoa, yes, this is my God. This is my Jesus. This is my generous Savior who has saved me from despair and hopelessness. Let's not be people who are selfish, but let's be people who are generous. I have three points here. The first is let's understand who God is. I believe if we truly understand God more and more and more and more, that will completely revolutionize and change who we are and how we see, we see our lives. God is a good God. We sang about it already. God is a good God. He'll never let us down. We sang it over and over. No, you'll never let us down. You'll never let us down. Ever, ever, ever. Never let us down. God is a good God. He's a good, good God. 
He's a generous God. He is generous to us. Romans 8.32 says, if, if God didn't hold back his own son, how much more would he give us all of the other stuff that we need already? He already gave us the greatest gift of all. There's nothing greater that he could have given us. It's been done already. There's nothing greater. He's, you have it. You have the greatest gift already. Jesus. So why would he not also give you all the other things as well? God is a God who interacts with people and provides for people. We see this in the Bible. So many different stories. We see Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he leads me. He guides me and directs me. But my question for you is this. It's two questions. Number one, do you believe that God is a God who provides? God is a God who takes care. Do you believe that? We need to get that settled in our heart. The second question, and this is just as important, is are you someone? Do you believe that you are someone who God provides for, who God takes care of, who God moves in miraculous ways for? Some people might say, yeah, I believe that God is that type of God. We see it in the Bible. He did it in the Old Testament. He did it in the New Testament. But they say, but I've never seen it in my own life. And they have doubts about their own life. No, if God can do it for them, God can do it for you. This is who God is. He doesn't change when he's talking to this person and then when he talks to you. He doesn't change when he talks to the pastor and then when he talks to you. He's the same God. And if God can do it for someone else, he can do it for you. So the two questions that I have, is God, do you believe that God is a God who provides? And secondly, do you believe that God is a God who provides for you? And if you have answered no to any of those questions, I would just encourage you. Just get into the presence of God. Find someone. Get connected with people in our church or our pastors and say, it's okay to be real and honest with, with doubts and fears that we have. It's okay. It's okay to, to say, yeah, I, I have a hard time believing that. Because when we face our fears and doubts in truthfulness and honesty, then God can start to work in those things. And the first step sometimes is admitting, yeah, I, I have a hard time. I have a hard time believing that. Well, let's talk about that. Let's see what the Bible says about that. Let's look at different people's testimonies that we know where God has done something great. And then we can start to build and, and, and grow our faith through the word of God. Second point is, so the first point is who God is. Second point is who we are. The Bible says that we are children of God. If we have faith and we believe with our hearts, God has raised him, God, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. We become children of God. And God cares for his kids. He's the best father. He's the best father. I'm a father. I'm a dad. But I'm an imperfect dad. Okay? I'm an imperfect father. But God is the perfect father. He's the perfect father. And that's who we are as a child of a perfect father. We are the children of a perfect father. We are a son or a daughter who has been invited into the provision of God's house. In the story of the prodigal son, it's actually the story of two sons. Both sons were invited into the house. And God invites us into his house, into his provision, into his safety. And so we are children of God. We are children who, is, who have been invited into the presence of God, into the house of God. You have to decide, like we said in the first point, that we are people, children of God, whom God can provide for. 
I am a person who God can provide for. And not only that, I am a person who God can provide for others through me. I am a child of Abraham, a son of Abraham. He's the father of faith. And so as we join in faith, Abraham is our father. And so we enter into that blessing that Abraham received. And the blessing was that we'd be, we'd be blessed and all the nations in the world would be blessed through us. We need to start thinking of ourselves not as people who, who just, just receive, but people who are the source of blessing for the people around us. People around us need hope. People around us need provision, sometimes financial, sometimes a meal. Sometimes people need, they need just a friend. We can be that source. We can be that blessing to those people who are all around us. Sometimes, sometimes we need to think of ourselves like this. That God wants to do miracles all around us. But what if God has already done the miracle in you and he wants you to be a miracle for somebody else? What if the miracle that God has for the person next to you is already in your pocket. That miracle could be in your pocket. Don't, don't just say, okay, God, yeah, I pray for this person. Pray you would provide for that person. But maybe God wants to provide for that person through you. God has blessed us to be a blessing. God has put his spirit upon us, not for us to shrink back, in hopelessness, not for us to shrink back in fear, but to grab a hold of this Kairos time, this season, when we don't know what's coming on the news tomorrow. We don't know about this, or we don't know about that, this sickness that's going around. We don't know about that, but we do know who our God is. We do know his calling on our lives, and the calling never changes compared to the seasons. The situation may change around us. The situation may change, but that doesn't mean that the calling changes. The calling remains the same. But the situation can be your opportunity to speak life, to speak hope, to speak love, because this is what your Heavenly Father has done for you. And just like Mary responding out of thankfulness, responding with a heart of generosity, responding because, Jesus, you've done this for me. I want to be a blessing to others as well. Before we finish, I don't know where you are watching this right now. Maybe you're at home, maybe with your small group. I want us to interact together in prayer. I don't, want us just, I don't want to just be standing up here praying for you guys. I want you to join your hearts with me as we pray. Because I, I feel like I want to pray for just a few different things. Number one, I understand how I hear stories every day about how people are being affected um, by this COVID-19, this uh, sickness and, the, and disease. And maybe you know someone who has been... Uh, affected personally, maybe they've gotten it, or you know, maybe your education is suffering, or maybe your income is suffering as a result of it. I want to pray for you guys. I want to pray for every person who's been affected by this. But secondly, I want to pray for all of us who are out there that God would use each one of us as people who rise up in faith and grab hold of this Kairos moment this opportunity, this time when we say, God, how can you use me? How can I be a blessing? How can I be generous with my finances, with my resources, with my time? How can I be a blessing in the lives of the people around me? Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your coworkers. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's your neighbors. God wants to, you to shine your light 
to be the salt of the earth, to be an influence, something different that's different than everything around you. Not the same, but different. So I'm going to pray for those two things. And I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, just join your hearts together in prayer with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness, oh God. Lord Jesus, right now, I pray for every person, Lord, who's watching this, Lord, who has been affected by this virus that's been going around. God, I pray for all those who, are, who have been uh, affected by this and have been made sick by this virus, and I speak healing to them in the name of Jesus. I speak healing by your power, by the power of your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit. I release healing into each person who has been affected by this, who has been uh, made sick through this vi because of this virus, oh God. Lord, I also pray for business owners. God, I pray for people who have, haven't been able to go to school and their education is suffering. God, I pray that you would make a way where there is, seems to be no way. Lord, I, I pray for people who've been put out of work, who don't have any jobs because of this thing, they, that they can't get any business right now because their business has been shut down. Lord, I speak provision, miraculous provision for them and their families. Lord, I pray that there would be no fear, no hopelessness, no doubt, but it would be, uh, they, they would rise up in faith and say, no, my God's got this. The situation might change, but my God is still the same. He never changes. Lord God, I speak life. I speak hope. I release the power of the Holy Spirit into every single person, Lord, who's watching. Lord, and I speak for all the Christians who are, who are involved in our church, Lord, church-wide. And I, I pray, God, Lord, that we would rise up with a spirit of faith. We would rise up and see this as an opportunity, a kairos moment, a divine time when God says, this is your time to shine. This is your time to shine. This is the time for the church to be the salt and the light outside of the church, in the neighborhoods, in the villages, in the, in the houses, in the workplaces, in the schools, to speak hope, to speak life, to speak faith, because that is who our God is. And Lord, I pray for each person, Lord, that we would just live completely captivated by the love of Jesus and your goodness to us. And like Mary poured out that perfume in generosity and love, Lord, we would pour out our lives in generosity and love to you and to all of those around us. Thank you so much for your word, God. Thank you so much for the reminder of your love. Thank you so much that you never leave us or forsake us. But each and every day, each and every week, you're faithful and you're constant. We love you greatly. We thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.